when it comes to our retirement, what are we really looking for? Firstly, we need investment products like PPF, mutual funds and stocks to create a corpus. When we eventually retire, we need monthly pension, which is where an annuity or an SWP, a systematic withdrawal plan becomes useful. And finally, we need protection, which is best served by a life insurance policy. So there are different products for different needs, but what if I told you there is a single product which addresses all these three needs, and most of us already have it in our financial portfolio. Yes, I am talking about the Employee Provident Fund or EPF as it's commonly called. And in this video, I'll be covering a range of topics. If you find this video useful, then do press the like button. And if you are from the HR department of a company, then feel free to add this video to your employee induction program. Let's begin. The Employee Provident Fund is essentially a social security scheme that is available to all salaried employees in India. The scheme is managed by the Employees Provident Fund organization and has the simple objective of providing financial security to employees after their retirement. Now, the EPF is not one scheme, but it actually comprises of three different schemes with three different objectives. The first part is, of course, the EPF, and that's where our retirement corpus is being accumulated and is the part we're going to focus on in this video. The second part within the EPF structure is EPS or the Employee Pension Scheme. And as you can make out from the name itself, its objective is to generate a pension for employees once they cross the age of 58. And the third and final part of EPF is the Employee Deposit Linked Insurance Scheme or EDLI, which is a life insurance cover that's provided to the members. I'll be taking up EPS and EDLI separately in a different video, but the good thing is that one doesn't need to register separately for availing all these three benefits. In other words, when you register for EPF, you are automatically registered for EPS and EDLI. All right, so how does an EPF scheme work? Well, the simple version of it starts with the employee allocating a small part of his or her salary towards the scheme. This number is often matched with an equal contribution from the employer. This combined money is then deposited with the EPFO. You continue to accumulate interest on it every year and when it's time to retire, you take it all out. And that's it. That's pretty much how the HR team will explain it when listing your CTC components during a salary negotiation. But the devil is in the details. So let's start with the word salary. Now for the purposes of EPF, salary means only two things. One, your basic, which is something everyone receives. And secondly, your DNS allowance, which is generally not there in private companies. In other words, salary as per the EPF definition does not include your HRA, your conveyance allowance, special allowance, or any other benefit given to you in your salary slip. Now, when it comes to eligibility, the present rules require that any organization with 20 or more employees will have to compulsorily register with the EPFO and provide their employees with EPF benefits. In fact, if an organization has less than 20 employees, then they too can join the EPF program on a voluntary basis. The rules also state that employees whose monthly salary is 15,000 rupees or less, well, that employee has to necessarily be a part of the EPF program. And finally, someone asked me this question once, is it possible to opt out of the EPF program altogether? And the answer to that is yes. So one can opt out of the scheme at the start of one's career, that is at the time of joining your first company. You can do this by filling up form 11 and your organization will then treat you as an excluded employee for PF purposes. Of course, you can join the EPF program later, but once you are enrolled under the scheme, you cannot be exempted from it unless you join a future company or a startup that is not registered under the EPF Act. It's a bit technical, so do grill your HR manager for more details. But having said this, most organizations will make it compulsory for their employees to join the scheme. And that's the scenario that we'll work with. In fact, let's go through an example, and I'm sure by the end of it, you'll have a clear idea on how your own EPF works. Now, typically an employee's deduction towards EPF comes to 12% of his or her basic salary. This number is equally matched by the employer, so 12 plus 12 adds up to 24%. However, this entire 24% does not go towards your EPF accumulation. So here's what happens. The 12% that was contributed by the employee goes entirely into EPF, so no complications there. The other 12%, the part which was contributed by the employer, well, that gets split into two parts. 
The larger chunk, which comes to 8.33%, goes towards your EPS, while the balance 3.67% is allocated towards your EPF accumulation. Which effectively means while 24% is apportioned towards Employee Provident Fund in your CTC, it's only 15.67% that is going towards your Wealth Accumulation Corpus, while the remaining 8.33% is there to help you receive a pension post your retirement. Now this knowledge of how the EPF is structured can help you in many ways. I think the most visible opportunity is for you to insist on a higher basic salary which automatically pushes up your PF contribution and therefore increases your retirement corpus. A second thing you can explore and if your organization allows it, then you can opt for the minimum mandatory PF contribution of 1,800 rupees that is 12% of 15,000 which consequently increases your take home salary. And if you're a business owner, then you can consider designing a salary structure where 100% of your salary is basic pay, which means you can push more contributions towards the EPF, which not only reduces your tax outgo, but also helps you create a good retirement corpus. So these are some techniques I found while researching for this video. And if you're keen on exploring these, then I'll certainly recommend you consult and work with a chartered accountant who will have a lot more detail and techniques at his disposal. If you're getting good value from this video, then please do give this video a thumbs up. And if you aren't a subscriber yet, then do consider becoming one as I can then serve you videos as soon as they are released and also share with you some investing strategies, tips and stories that I continually post in the community section. Now, as contributors to EPF, you, me, everyone has a number of lingering questions. And the rest of this video would be about answering some of the more common ones. If you want more details on any of the questions or answers, then definitely access the internet. And just to help out, I've compiled a list of useful EPF specific articles that you can find in the description of this video. Well, the simple answer is yes. And an employee can contribute well beyond 12% of one's basic pay. This number can go all the way up to 100%, but do remember, your employer is under no obligation to match your contribution and can continue at the mandated 12%. Yes, absolutely. And transfer of EPF accounts is now a very common thing with people changing jobs all the time. In fact, the EPFO has made transfers a lot simpler now and all it takes is an online transfer claim that can be submitted via the EPFO's unified member portal. Okay, so as per the EPF rules, if an employee resigns from his or her job, that is they are unemployed, then the employee can withdraw the entire amount in their PF account two months after their last working day. Right, so let's start with the rate of interest and the EPFO has just announced an interest rate of 8.15% for the financial year 2023. Now, EPF interest rates are proposed on an yearly basis. And over the years, this has gone as low as 5% and as high as 12%. And a lot of it depends on the bond yields and a little bit on equities as well as the EPFO is allowed to invest up to 15% in the Indian stock market. But an interest rate of 8.15% is definitely one of the highest returns amongst all small saving schemes. And that has generally been the case with somewhat tells us that maximizing your EPF is probably more important than your PPF, National Savings Certificate, Kisan Vikas Patrika and other investments. Right, so this is again a very common question and there is a small story behind this. You see, in the financial year 2011 or maybe 2012, the EPFO decided to stop paying interest on accounts that had been inoperative for more than 36 months. This was done to discourage subscribers from neglecting their EPF accounts. And understandably, this was met with a lot of resistance, which led to its rollback from November 2016 onwards. Which means now, even if your account is lying dormant for more than three years, it will continue to earn interest like it did earlier until the member attains the age of 58 years.
Right, so there are a few ways of doing this. Method one is to go to the EPFO website and you can check your balance under the member passbook service. Secondly, you can use the Umang app under EPFO and click on view passbook. You can also send an SMS using a defined syntax and there's also a missed call service for receiving your PF balance. So yes, a member can withdraw from one's EPF balance before retirement, but there are a few terms and conditions that one needs to be mindful of. And just to clarify, we are now talking about scenarios beyond unemployment, which I have already covered in an earlier answer. Now, premature withdrawal is allowed under very specific scenarios like education, purchase of land, marriage, medical emergency, repayment of home loan, etc. A comprehensive list of scenarios is available on the EPF India website, but let me take you through a couple of scenarios to illustrate the complexity involved. So let's say one wants to withdraw for medical reasons. In this case, the member is allowed to withdraw the employee's accumulated corpus or six times the monthly salary, whichever is lower. However, in case you are withdrawing some money for, let's say, a wedding, then the rules require that the member must have completed at least seven years of service and in this case, 50% of the employee's contribution with interest can be withdrawn. So different purposes have different rules, so one has to be mindful of that. In case the Provident Fund subscriber passes away, then the nominee may withdraw 100% of the accrued funds by submitting Form 20 at the nearest Provident Fund office. And in case there is no nominee, then a member of the subscriber's immediate family may apply for the withdrawal and there are some procedures around it. In addition to the EPF balance, the family is also entitled to receive life insurance benefits of up to 7 lakhs under the EDLI scheme. And there is also a monthly pension for the spouse or child under the EPS scheme. Okay, let's start with the contributions and any money that goes towards your EPF account is eligible for tax deductions up to 1.5 lakhs under Section 80C of the Income Tax Act. Now, for many years, EPF came under the triple E or the exempt, exempt, exempt category, which means there was no taxability at the time of contribution, no tax was charged on the accrual of interest, and there were also no taxes at the time of withdrawal. But then the union budget of 2020 changed all that when the Ministry of Finance introduced a tax element on the employer's contribution to PF, NPS and superannuation. So under this rule, if the contribution and the interest exceeds 7.5 lakh rupees in a financial year, then this becomes taxable in the hands of the employee under the head income from salary. This of course was done with the intention of bringing some tax parity on highly paid employees who were able to design the salary packages in a way that a large part of it was in the tax exempt category. Then effective the 1st of April 2022, the government brought in another rule that says, while interest on an employee's contribution to EPF up to 2.5 lakhs per year is tax free, if this contribution were to go over 2.5 lakhs, then any interest earned is taxable in the hands of the employee. So these are a couple of tax rules one has to be wary of, but from what I have read, the above changes may not affect individuals who are earning a basic salary of up to 20 lakhs and are contributing 12% of their basic salary towards EPF, which is where a majority of individuals in India anyway fall under. Now, when it comes to withdrawals, the EPF member is not required to pay any tax on the contribution amount and accumulated interest in case the EPF balance is withdrawn after five years of continuous service. However, in case the withdrawal is done prior to the completion of five years, then some taxes are payable and a TDS of 10% is also deducted on the total amount withdrawn. So this is my understanding and research, but if you want to be super sure, then do consult a tax advisor who will have a more rounded understanding of these tax provisions. The Employee Provident Fund is just one of the many retirement options that are available to us. In fact, this instrument competes with PPF, NPS, fixed deposits, mutual funds, etc. But when I put together the benefits of a decently good interest rate, very low credit risk due to government backing, a pension element, an insurance element, and a triple E benefit, it is rather easy to understand why the Employee Provident Fund remains one of the best retirement planning tools that are out there. 
I also love the fact that it is a very convenient savings tool and all you have to do is to fill some forms during induction day and your HR or payroll department takes care of everything. In other words, one can think of the EPF as a debt mutual fund SIP, but with a lot less taxes and definitely a lower amount of risk. I sincerely hope you found this video informative and useful. And if you have any questions on EPF, then do let me know and I'll try to answer most of them over a follow up community post. Once again, thank you for your time. Do like this video, do share it with your friends and I'll see you three days from now. Until then. Mm -hmm.